We're doing a short series on evangelism, and I talked the last couple of times about the journey of faith coming towards Jesus and actually increasing to the point where we trust him with our lives and our future, and then moving forward and trusting him with even more. And I'd like to ask the question today, what is faith? Because it's a word we use a lot, and I think it's very much misunderstood. So, so could somebody give me a definition of the word faith? Belief in something. Okay. Belief in something. Anyone else like to? Yeah? Trust with no conditions. Okay. All right. So we could go on. I could get lots of possible definitions. Um, uh, my goal today is to answer this question, what is faith? And I'd like to look at how the word faith is used and misused in our culture, what it really means, and then what it means to trust Jesus. Um, does anybody know where this quote came from? Faith is believing what you know ain't so. It's, uh, it's Mark Twain from Huckleberry Finn. Uh, it's kind of a common thing, you know, it's not true, but you believe it anyway. I think one of the fundamental problems we have is a false divide between faith and evidence. The idea of a leap of faith, you know, there's no evidence, so we just have to leap there in faith, and which is completely wrong. There is more evidence from Christianity than for most other things that are around. In fact, uh, you get the expression, which I hate, faith-based community. If somebody says to me, is you, no, do, you, do you lead a faith-based community? I would say, no, actually, I lead an evidence-based community. This is an evidence-based community. You know, we have so much evidence in Jesus Christ. We have so much evidence in the scriptures. Um, now, that doesn't mean to say we, we, don't, we're not, we don't have faith, but according to the way it's misused, there's like faith over that side where you have to leap to when you don't have the evidence at all, and then we have the evidence. Another false divide is um, between faith and science. And the idea is that, um, uh, you know, the science, which is all about building up hard facts, and then there's faith, which is where you don't have anything. And I, I just want to say something briefly about science. And science is based on the scientific method, which, just simplifying it, you look at things in God's creation, uh, you come up with a hypothesis about how it works. You do some tests to see if the hypothesis seems to work. And you look at the results to see if what your tests come up with are supported. So a good example would be in the 1800s in, in uh, Vienna, there was a, a Hungarian doctor who was uh, looked after a, um, a ward, a labor ward in a hospital, women giving birth, and there was so, such a high mortality rate. And he had an idea, which was, which was, he got a lot of attacks for having this idea, but he was very strong with it, that it was to do with washing your hands beforehand. And if it was kept clean, they wouldn't die. So he did an ex a proper experiment. So everybody washed their hands uh, scrupulously, kept everything clean. Mortality rate dropped down, far less women dying at childbirth. The trouble was that they didn't believe him. They said he was crazy. And he's, it took a long, long time for his ideas to get forward. And this is one of the problems with the scientific method. It's very good in theory, but in practice, it actually requires faith. Because, you know, uh, was the bias in the experiments, were they conducted fairly? Were, was it actually you know, stacked up so it would prove your point anyway? Was the money behind it? And often there are scientific experiments which are done in one lab and then nobody else can replicate them. There's something odd going on there. And, um, and then, of course, it depends on whether people believe you. And this poor man, nobody believed him and he kept trying to persuade them to wash their hands. People were dying. In the, he ended up in a, in a mental hospital and it died in a mental hospital. And it took a long time afterwards before he was recognized that his ideas were right. And so the scientific method can't be put as like the gold standard against everything else because it has got lots of flaws in practice because in practice it requires trust in the people doing all of the work. Uh, and uh, so another, another uh, couple of categories I'd like to talk about, materialism and non-materialism. 
<clears throat> so non-materialism is reality is more than the material world around us, which I believe that. I believe there's you know, God and spiritual world and everything. Materialism, which is often science kind of carries that baggage, only what is physical is real. For example, love is just your brain chemicals. And so anything other than that is in the realms of, of mystical and faith and so on. And these are categories in our society which are wrong, and we have to recognize that. But there's another idea in our society that's um, really, really dangerous, I think. Um, as people have more and more reacted against materialism, more and more agreed that there is a spiritual reality, it, it's, it's good to have some sort of spiritual belief, uh, there is uh, an idea that it really actually doesn't matter what you believe, providing you put your faith in it. I recently had an, an email from a, a, an organization called Faith Act, founded by the former Prime Minister Tony Blair in the UK. And this is what it said. Will your church be part of a multi-religion faith group? Why is faith so important? At the heart of Faith Act is the belief that faith can be a force for good. So it doesn't really matter if what you believe is true, because faith itself is a force for good. Do you get the idea? that somehow faith is this mystical force which is somehow going to help you. So if I wrote to them and said, um, I've got faith, I believe in Santa Claus, would you let me in your organization? Well, maybe they would let me in. What if I said, I have faith, my belief is that Mark Zuckerberg, founder of Facebook, is really a lizard. And actually, that's a, that is a major conspiracy theory out there. I believe I have faith that he is a lizard. Would they let me in? Well, they probably might not. Uh, but, but you see the problem. Where's the evidence for this? And that leads to an even more dangerous idea. Um, even if you know something is false, then it's still good to have faith. Even if you, you know it's not true. And there's a famous story of, of Linus in the Peanuts comic. And Linus, the little boy, is writing a letter to the great pumpkin because the great pumpkin comes every year and gives toys to all the children. And he believes this. And he's got complete faith in the great pumpkin. And then um, uh, Charlie Brown comes up and says, when are you going to stop believing something that isn't true? And uh, Linus turns to him, but you believe in presents from the man in red with the white beard. And Charlie Brown says, it seems we're divided by denominational differences. <laughs> so this idea that, uh, you know, there's this, this, you've got faith in something. Um, well, you might, you know, we can laugh at this and so on. But I, I recently saw a, a, a video by this woman who said she just watched the, the, the great, the, the, the pumpkin um, animation on Peanuts and um, she was so excited by little Linus because he believed it, even though it wasn't true, he had such a firm faith. And she said, I'm so excited and I'm going to have faith for my life because I'm inspired by little Linus. I thought, what? So this faith was false. The great pumpkin never showed up, but he carried on believing and you're going to take that as inspiration because somehow you think it's good just to have faith. It really doesn't matter what you believe in. Well, you may laugh at this, but there's a Christian movement called Word of Faith, which actually trusts in the force of faith. And it's not so much trusting God, but trusting my own faith. It's not, is God able to answer my prayer? Because we know he can answer anything. But do I have enough faith? In other words, is my, I've got faith in my faith, and if I have enough faith in my faith, then it will happen. So we, we uh, even Christians can fall into this problem. So we can't get through this life without trusting lots of things. We have to put our trust in things. And so I want to ask what faith really means, what it really means to have trust. What does this mean? And uh, oh, I don't want to show you that yet. Um, let's think about whether this works out in real life. What would it be 
what, what would it be to try and put a logic in medical beliefs that um, it really doesn't matter whether, you, whether your truth is uh, actually true or not. If it's your truth and you believe it, then it's good. So some people believe that if you get a wound, you should clean, keep it as clean as possible. And other people believe rub cow dung into it. And that's the best thing to heal it. Um, does it really matter as long as you believe it? Does it really, as long as you have faith in, in washing your hands, is that the important thing? No, of course, none of us think that. It actually makes a difference whether what you believe in is actually true. And um, I'm, you might want to close your eyes for a moment if you are squeamish about pictures, but this is leeches sucking blood from somebody. So I'm going to uh, just take it, take it back over there so you don't have to be watching that all this time. Uh, this is um, uh, a story from George Washington, the, the, the famous uh, George Washington from the United States. And um, he had a sore throat at one point and he went to the doctor. And the doctors applied leeches because they believed in those days that most problems in your body were due to too much blood pressure. And you had to release the blood pressure by putting leeches on. And the leeches, if you don't know, suck your blood. So those leeches were stuck on there, sucking his blood. And um, it didn't get any better. So they said, more leeches, obviously. And it's estimated that he lost about five pints of blood to leeches. And if you don't know, you have about eight pints in your body. And uh, sadly, he died of a sore throat. And most historians think that it was actually the leeches that killed him, not the sore throat. So was the problem that he didn't have faith in the leeches? No, the problem was that he did have faith in the leeches. That was the problem. And so to sum up, there's a dangerous misunderstanding in our culture uh, that we usually we don't apply to our, to our health. But the misunderstanding is that it doesn't matter what you're trusting as long as you have enough faith. But I'm going to suggest to you that the important questions are these. The questions are the questions we ask of our doctor, lawyer, dentist, teacher, banker, insurance agent, even our taxi driver. What we say is, what do I need this person to do for me? Is this person capable of doing this? Can I trust this person to do it for me? And we do this process many, many times. You know, even getting on a streetcar, you know, you're putting some trust in, in a driver there. And then for some things, you're putting a lot more trust. If you're going to the doctor, you, you know, can I trust this person with my life? If I'm going to a banker, can I trust him with my finances? And so um, this is what really what faith means. This is the real meaning of faith. It's can I trust this person with these things in our life? And so I think that I would prefer to use the word trust rather than the word faith because faith has got this kind of abstract feel in our culture and trust is very concrete because you trust somebody to do something. And uh, those, we have those two words in the English. In the Greek, the New Testament, there is just one word and about you know, trusting Jesus, having faith. It's the same word, and we could translate it either. I prefer to translate it trust, because it brings out this concrete sense. So let's just think of these questions for Jesus. He asked people to trust him in two ways. One, to trust his teaching, to trust what he said was true. The other was to trust him as a person to trust that he would take him through. And of course, these are closely connected. What about his teaching? He came teaching that there is another life after this one. In fact, we can begin this other life before we die. We can begin it right away. And he called it living in his kingdom. But he didn't just say this. He demonstrated this new life. And he showed it what it looked like in practice. And here's a conversation that I, I showed you last week. And we're going to look at it again this week because I think it's so important. It's about 
somebody trusting. This is the conversation with Martha, and Martha has, her, her brother has died, Jesus has arrived after he died, and she says to Jesus, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. So is there some trust there? Yeah. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. So more trust? Yes. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. So he's giving him to her some teaching. How is she going to respond to that teaching? Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So yes, she agrees in the teaching, but now he's going to challenge her with, do you trust me as a person? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And I want to say to you, this is a question not just for Martha, but for you today. This is the core of the gospel message. Do you believe Jesus? Do you believe that he can take you through the enemy of death, into eternity. Do you believe him? Can you tell me what Martha said? She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. Yes, he, she believes. And shortly after that, she sees evidence as her brother is raised from the dead. I, well, you may say, you know, if I actually was there and I saw him raised from the dead, I could believe in this Jesus. But like, how do I believe now when he's not around anymore? Well, first of all, there were quite a few there who saw the raised from the dead and they didn't believe. In fact, they wanted to kill Lazarus again, um, which, which shows that they, they, weren't, they, they weren't looking at the evidence. They'd already got the idea, the preconception. They didn't want to believe Jesus. But we need to ask this question, what it means to trust Jesus. How do we have this trust in Jesus? So let's take you then way past Lazarus' time into the future to a time when Jesus was raised from the dead, been in heaven. The church was already growing, it had no longer just been preached to Jews, but to Gentiles as well. And Paul finds himself in the city of Athens, which has never heard the gospel, never heard about Jesus, and he finds himself there, and uh, we're going to see what happens. This is Acts chapter 17, verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was greatly upset because he saw the city was full of idols. So he was addressing the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles in the synagogue and in the marketplace every day, those who happened to be there. Also, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him, and some were asking, what does this foolish babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. They said this because he was proclaiming the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took Paul and brought him to the Areopagus, which was a place where they would have debates in public, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are proclaiming. So here we have a great example of Paul teaching about faith to these people. For you are bringing some surprising things to our ears, so we want to hear what they mean. All the Athenians and foreigners who lived there used to spend their time in nothing else than telling or listening to something new. Does that remind us of today? <laughs> yeah, they would have the internet. Yeah, they could get it. So Paul stood before the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see you're very religious in all respects. For as I went around and observed closely your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So in Athens, they were polytheists. That means they believed there were lots of gods and they wanted to worship them all and they were afraid they'd forgotten one. 
So, well, we've forgotten him. Let's put him an altar. And they made an altar just for this God they might have forgotten. So Paul sees this and says, well, this could, I could use this as a lead-in for my message. Uh, he says, therefore, what you worship without knowing this, I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, who is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made with human hands, nor is he served by human needs. And I put this in bold here, as if he needed anything because he himself gives life and breath and everything to everyone. So here's his first argument. He says, look, why would you, if there's a God who, gives every, who you get your life and breath from, why would he need you to make a temple for him? And actually, Solomon said a similar thing back in the Old Testament when he built the temple. He said, even the universe can't contain you, let alone this temple. Um, so here's his, his first argument. Look, why are, you built, why are you trying to constrict your God? If he really is these gods who you, they say you are, why are they restricted? He says, from one man, he made every nation of the human race, and they would agree with that, uh, to inhabit the entire earth, determining their appointed times, in other words, the events that happened, the boundaries where they live, so they would search for God and perhaps grope around for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move about and exist, as, it, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. So this is very interesting, because what he's appealing to is something which I think all of us know, that there, we all of us, even atheists, I believe, have got a sense that there is something around. There is some being. I heard of one man who was an atheist, and I read, was reading about him, and he said, I had this experience, and I knew that somebody was looking after me. Like, somebody was there. I knew it. It couldn't have been a coincidence. And... So he's appealing to the fact, not only is their belief irrational, that a god could live in this little temple you built for them, but also you know inside there is something more. And I think that this is something that everybody knows, whether they admit it or not, that there is something more, there is some spiritual power that is above everything. And then he points out again then how illogical they are. If we are God's offspring, we should not think the deity is like gold or silver or stone or an image made by human skill or imagination. See, they'd made these idols. They'd made these gold statues and stone statues to worship. And he says, but look, you're being illogical here because if you believe that we are the offspring of God, how can this fit together? And so Paul is talking about faith, trust in Jesus, but he's doing it through reasoning them because faith and reason are not opposite here. They fit very well together. In fact, uh, he comes to the conclusion now, but in fact, there are some of them that are actually interested enough in his arguments to eventually become Christians. He says that, therefore, though God has overlooked such times of ignorance, he now commands all people everywhere to repent because he set a day on which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by a man he has designated, having provided a proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. And when they heard about the resurrection from the dead, some began to scoff, but others said, we will hear you again about this. So he left the Areopagus. But some people joined him and believed. Among them were Dionysius, who was a member of the Areopagus, one of the debaters, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So what's going on there? Why do these people believe? Because God has placed evidence in their hearts. Somewhere they know, yes, this is true. And that and they know, and also Paul has, has shown them what they're currently believing is false. So I'm not showing you as this is the only way of declaring the gospel. I'm just showing you as one example 
of how the gospel can be preached in a, in a situation where they know nothing about the true God, absolutely nothing, and their interest can be awoken and they can begin this journey of coming to Jesus. And I'm sure Paul explained a lot more afterwards to these people as they came to Christ. So this is Paul in Athens. And so what we saw at that, in that quote when Jesus is speaking to Martha is he is promising a new kind of existence. We can see this, and this is the last quote I'm going to give you from the scriptures. Mark chapter 8, 34 and 35. Calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, in other words, trust him, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. If there is no cost, there's no faith. But believing Jesus has a cost. Jesus says, I will offer you everything, but you have to give me your life. In other words, you have to deny yourself and give your life to me and follow me, which might involve suffering. It might even involve dying. If you try and keep hold of your life and grab hold of it, you'll lose it. But if you allow your life to come to me for my sake, then you will, you will reach this incredible goal. So this is, a, this is the, the substance of what Jesus is asking us to believe. This is the core, no cost, no faith. The kind of thing that if Jesus turns out to be wrong, you have lost everything. But what he offers is not just this life, but in the age to come. There is so much evidence. If we want to look at evidence for Christianity, you know, I can give you books on it, I can show you stuff. So much evidence that Jesus was raised from the dead, that a supernatural power grew Christianity. But uh, simply, he is calling us to trust him. But this message today isn't just for people who are not Christians. It's just as much for you if you are a follower of Jesus today. Because you need to grow your trust. You need to grow your faith. How do you grow your faith? By putting your trust in something and seeing it works. So, for example, if I tell you, you know, if you work out every day, you'll feel better. And you say, nah, I maybe, maybe not. But then you try it, and you do feel better. Then your faith is going to grow. As you try it, and it works, you try more, and it works. That is how faith works. You exercise it, and it grows. Last week, we saw the example of the man who Jesus said, go your way, your son lives. He trusted Jesus and he saw his son raised up and alive. So trust is not an on-off switch. You've got everything or you've got nothing. Trust is something we can grow in. And then I'm going to put my last slide up here about growing in trust or growing in faith. Trust can grow in any relationship. You know, you have people that you know in your life, whether they are friends or whether they are um, professionals who help you, and you know that good experiences enable you to trust them more. And if they give you negative experiences, they fail you, you trust them less. And so you build your trust by putting your trust in them and seeing if it works out. And so... Growing as a Christian is growing in this trust, which means living in a way that flows from believing he is trustworthy. I want to challenge you now. I want to challenge you to ask God, how can I trust you more? How can I do things which are only going to be working out well if you are real God, if you are true? And then when God answers your prayer and, and brings it, comes through for you, your faith grows. 
How much do I trust him? Ask yourself, can I trust him more? So I just want to end by saying, my challenge to you is to work out, out the, faith, the faith muscle in 2024. Work out your faith muscle in 2024. What does this mean? It means more. It means committing time to Jesus, for example, every day, doing things that you know he wants you to do, not doing things that you don't, he doesn't want you to do, but also giving energy and resources in your life to his way and his life. Because that way, when you see the blessing from that, your faith will grow. The disciples started off with little faith, didn't they? They followed Jesus, and then they saw more, and they followed him, and they saw more, and in the end, they were willing to give their lives for him. I want to challenge you, whether you are a Christian this morning or not. Jesus is trustworthy. He will never let you down. You will have the joy of being with him for eternity if you trust him with your life. Let's just pray, shall we? And I'd like you all to pray with me and, and really pray that your faith muscle will grow. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've not left us with nothing. You've not left us in the darkness, but you've sent the light of the world, Jesus Christ, that we may have life, have it eternal and have it in abundance. We pray, Lord, we'll believe this. We pray, Lord, that each one of us will trust Jesus to the point where we are willing to give him everything. Our time, our resources, our belief. Lord, we pray that if there's people here who are not Christians, Lord, that they would just put their trust in you and you, they would know that you are their Lord and Savior. And if they're in all of us, Lord, here who are Christians, build our faith in you, build our trust in you as we move forward in this year because we know that you will prove us faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.